Good evening. Appreciate uh, everyone being here this evening and uh, hope that you all will be able to stay tonight uh, for the reception afterwards uh, to honor both Brianna and Ben. Um, appreciate uh, their families and these kids and what they mean uh, to this congregation. Uh, so again, I invite you to say, encourage you to say, um, and then we'll have our lesson tonight and then at the end, uh, after the close of the uh, song, I'll uh, call the elders uh, up and uh, our graduates will call up one at a time and uh, I'll uh, ask one of our elders to pray for them and, and close us in prayer after that. wanted to talk tonight especially to our graduates. It's not that uh, everyone can pay attention, should pay attention. Hopefully uh, there will be something that you can gather from this. Um, but I really wanted to focus on them this evening. As Steve mentioned this morning, we're taking this <coughs> uh, to kind of look at our youth. Uh, and today we want to focus on these graduates. Uh, these graduates that uh, have attended here and do attend here. Uh, so we wanted to kind of talk to them, spend some time celebrating them, uh, and acknowledge them uh, as they get ready for this next part of their life. Uh, this is something that we go through, especially for me as a youth minister as a teacher, it's sort of something that I've come to realize happens obviously once a year, uh, where we close one chapter and we begin the next. Um, as I've said with youth ministry, it's kind of nice. I get two new years, especially with youth ministry and teaching. Um, start the new year in January, and then again, I'll start again in the fall with a new school year. Uh, so I'm one of those that tends to mess things up, so it's good that I get two fresh starts throughout the year. Uh, that helps me out. So, wanted to look tonight, talk to you tonight about taking a leap of faith. This is something that these graduates will do um, as they go on to this next chapter. Uh, a leap of faith is an expression that we've all heard, but we all understand it. It's when we're going to do something or take something on, but we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I've made this analogy before, and it's difficult to think of something different, but, but it's hard for us as parents to envision anything else. With our children, we have a series of spurts, and we encourage them. We uh, push them towards things. Uh, their first steps, their first words. We have a series of firsts, and, and then a series of miles. And then we begin to get into things that are more and more difficult. And for me, graduation, this next step is sort of like teach the child to ride a bike. Uh, we've all been there. If you've got kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews, um, we've all tried to teach someone to ride a bike. Many of us probably learned to ride a bike. Some of us maybe were that person that just quit and said, that's it, I'm done, I'm not going to do it. But we all remember that feeling. When our parents had maybe one hand on the handlebars, one hand on the end of the back of the seat, and we're running along with you. And the fear that you had as a child, and you're pedaling, and you're pedaling, and you're pedaling, probably each of your parents had a different technique for teaching. And then eventually you let go. And it's difficult as a child because this is a scary moment because you're no longer, you no longer have that person holding on to you and being there in case you lose your balance. It's up to you. And you just pedal and you just go. And it's a scary moment as a child. The news flash is it's a scary moment for us as parents too. It's hard to let go. Hard to let go and trust that our kids are going to be okay. To say, okay, I, I feel like I've prepared you enough. We are in our house past the bike riding phase and into the next terrifying phase, which is our oldest got a permit, a driver's permit, and just pray for our entire family as we go through this. Um, I, I'm typically the driver instructor, um, and I, apparently I'm not very good at that. I'm going to put that on my list of other things that I'm not very good at. Driver instructor is also one of these things. But it's a scary thing to realize that in just a few months I'm going to give my daughter the keys to a car and say, you can do this. Uh, 
Um, and that terrified me. Um, because I was 16 once, and you know what a wonderfully responsible young man I was. So obviously she's going to be the same way. So we have these moments as parents where we have to let go. We hope that our kids are prepared. We hope that they are ready for that next step in life. That they are ready to pedal on their own. That they are ready to swim without water wings. That they are ready to drive a car. That they are ready for the next chapter in their life. So we want to just kind of focus on that tonight and talk about this next step, this leap of faith that you are taking. We already looked at Genesis chapter 12. All right, verses 1 through 4. We talked about the fact that God told Abraham to step out on faith, take a leap of faith, go to a country that I will show you. God didn't even say to Abraham, this is where you're headed. He just says, go. And Abraham, being faithful the way that he is, goes, leaves his family, takes with him his own family, and goes off on his own. And God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you this great nation. But Abraham doesn't know how that's going to happen. He doesn't know when that's going to happen. He doesn't know a lot of information. So he's stepping out completely on faith. He is stepping out by himself. Of course, we know that God is with him, and that is a promise that God makes to him. But sometimes we lose sight of it. Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 looks at this call of faith, we sometimes call it. it. talks about all of these individuals who step out on faith. We talked about this a little bit in our, in our class this morning. All of these individuals that are listed in Hebrews 11 didn't know what was coming next. You have Noah, who is told by God to build a boat, to build an ark, despite the fact that there's no rain, despite the fact that everybody else is making fun of him, he's told to step out on faith, to make a decision, because God wants him to do that, to do something even though he doesn't know what the outcome is. And, and Hebrews 11 talks about so many of these people, it talks about Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, it talks about Joseph and Moses. Talks about the walls of Jericho falling down because of faith. There is no logical reason for the walls to fall. There is no scientific fact about the vibration that was caused by the shouting or the sounds of trumpets. It fell because God made them fall. And it fell because of the Israelites' faith. Hebrews chapter 12 kind of concludes this thought. It talks about, therefore, Hebrews 12, 1, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This is great advice for all of us, especially these tragedies. Put away the things that are gonna keep you down. You have a race. You are racing not with your GPA, not with your academic credentials, not even with the job that you might secure, but you are racing with your faith. You are racing towards the finish line, which is ultimately heaven. It's not to say that those things aren't important. I don't want to say that. But nothing is more important than your faith in God. Nothing is more important than where you spend eternity. And so it's important that we get rid of the things that are going to weigh us down. That we look to not only the cloud of witnesses and the people around us today that are going to encourage us and uplift us, but also to these people that we have seen in the past, the Noah, the Moses, the Abraham, the Isaac, and Jacobs. Those are our cloud of witnesses to draw inspiration from. Stepping out on faith, Peter, in Matthew chapter 14. Jesus has come out on the water, and the disciples are afraid. They can't believe what they're seeing, and they think they must be seeing a ghost. And so Peter called out to them, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. 
Again, we are oftentimes critical of Peter's lack of faith, but he still has more faith than the 11 guys in the boat. Peter stepped out, he takes the steps, he walks out on the water, and he thinks. Not necessarily the ending of the story that we want, but the good news is that Peter knows where to look when he does see. And that is when he focuses on Jesus. And that is when he knows that he is sinking because of his lack of faith, and he needs to focus back on where that faith is. But he steps out on faith. Just the same as Abraham did, just as all of these people did in Hebrews 11. You have to step out on faith. You have to trust that God will be there, that he will provide for you. That he will be faithful to you. You have to be faithful to him. The second idea that I would give you is to take risks. I'll be honest, I'm not usually a risk taker. But I would encourage you to not shy away away from taking risks. Without risk, you sometimes miss reward. And there are biblical examples of taking risks. David and Goliath, 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David knew that he was outmatched. David was no dummy. David was confident in his abilities. But it wasn't about what he could do. It was about what God could do. David knew that God would be with him. He knew that God would not allow his name to be decimated. And so David takes the risk. He says, I'll fight this giant. David, who had no business being the warrior that Israel did. But he's willing to take a risk. To step out and say, I will be the one that's going to fight this guy. There was a, there was a book a few years ago that talks about this. It talks about the fact that David doesn't focus on the giant, but rather he focuses on God. And that's a good, a good rule to live by. When you face your problems and your fears and you focus on them, those things become giants. They can get where you think that they're insurmountable, but when you focus on God, you see the solution. God is for us who can be against us. David knew that he had to take a risk, that he had to step out and face this giant. He knew that it was important. The book of Daniel, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of these gentlemen stepped out on faith, and all of them took a risk. I, I love the, the passage uh, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand before the king, and they say, our God is able to save us, but if he doesn't, that to me shows true faith, and that they were truly taking their risk. They had no assurance. They had no reassurance. Scripture doesn't tell us Anywhere that we know of that, that God told them, this is what you need to do, and I'm going to be there. They took a risk. They said, this is the right thing to do. We're going to do it. It might end bad. That's the very definition of taking a risk. It might end bad. I, again, as I tell the youth group, there typically is uh, two rules that we go back to on our trip one, that you maintain a Christ like attitude, that you model that behavior of Jesus Christ, and then the second is that you don't do anything stupid. As I tell you three kids, if you're not sure if it's something stupid, if it starts with, hey, watch this, it's probably stupid. All right? So I'm not talking about taking a risk and being stupid. I'm saying take a risk and trust God in your risk. Don't be afraid to step out a little bit of your comfort zone. Do things that you're maybe not used to doing. But keep your faith strong. Take a risk. Sometimes we get in our own way and we don't look at the things that we need to do. Sometimes taking a risk can just be, instead of going directly to your seat on Sunday morning or Sunday night, 
to walk across and speak to somebody else. To find someone that you don't know here in this congregation and know them. Meet them. Find out about them. It can be uncomfortable. It can be outside of your comfort zone. I don't want to do that. I want to go. I want to sit in my seat. I want to worship and I want to be done. But maybe we take a risk and we find some new people. For those of you that are graduating, maybe you take a risk and tell someone about Jesus. You take a risk to share your faith, to tell them what it is that you believe. Again, as we said, taking risks is all about the danger involved in it. Thankfully, we live in a world today where the stoning of Stephen would be hopefully something that no one would ever have to do, but Stephen understood this. Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed them with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Spirit gave them to heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen was almost past the point of risk because he was a nation. But he knew that he could not risk being silent. He had to speak the truth of God. So we'd encourage you to step out on faith. We'd encourage you to take risks. I'd also encourage you to go the extra mile. We've heard this expression many times. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 41 is where it comes from. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. This came from the idea that the Roman soldiers were allowed to take Hebrews, Jews that they wanted and required them, compel them to carry their pack, their gear for a mile. They had to do so by law. They had to. It was not an optional task. If you were, if you were picked by a Roman soldier to do this, you had to do this. But here Jesus is saying to them, you don't just go the one mile. When you get to that point, you say to them, no, I'll go a little bit further. I'm going to go that extra mile. I can only imagine how a soldier would react to that. We've all been struck by the fact that when we've had people that do kindness for us, that we weren't expecting. That it's not necessary. It's not just basic human decency, not just being kind to people, but doing more than what people expect. Sometimes I think our society, our world, has gotten kind of stuck in these, that's not my job, or I'm not going to do that. And we quit looking out further for other people. We quit going that extra mile. And so I hope that's something that you all will remember. I look at the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Jesus gives this perfect example of who is my neighbor. And as he's telling this parable, as he's telling this story, this teacher of the law, as he says, who can then act as a neighbor? Can't even say the word Samaritan. But in Luke chapter 10, here's, here's what's interesting in Luke chapter 10, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two there. I gave him to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will come again, and I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor? Him to go among the We've already said, couldn't even mouth the word Samaritan. He just says the one who has compassion. But if you look, the Samaritan goes the extra mile. The priest and the Levite didn't stop, but the Samaritan stops. He takes care of this person, brings him to an end, he takes care of him some more there. He doesn't just say, okay. I'm going to get this guy where he needs to be and then just he's on. He departs and he pays the innkeeper and then he says, look, if, if there's any more expenses, when I come back, I'm going to take care of it. He goes above and beyond. He goes that extra mile. 
So tonight as we get ready to conclude, sometimes maybe there's a lot of things. I'm sure that uh, Ben and Brianna, people are going to give you a lot of advice. And some of it's going to go in one out, in one ear, out the other. Some of it's going to be stuff that you're going to hold on to forever. Um, but if you get confused, it's always easy to just look at the simple things. We want to know what God wants us to do. Mark chapter 12. Then one of the scribes came, verse 28, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them all well, asked them, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered them, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love your Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. Is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. So again, if it boils down to what should I do in these situations, it goes down to loving God and then loving people. These are the simplest things that you can do. Love God, keep his commands, and love his people and look out for them. Hopefully this is advice that we can all take to heart. Hopefully there's been something that each of us can take away from. We've talked about new chapters, new beginnings, and new things in life. But the first chapter, the first step that you have to do is to commit your life to Christ in that. So in a minute, Sam has a song, will stand for an invitation. It's an opportunity for you, if you've not made that decision to follow Christ, to make that decision to be baptized in Him. If you have fallen away and need to come home, if you need prayers to the church. If there's anything we can do, we offer an invitation now. So we stand and sing.